Hi, everyone. We are going to get started. Uh, welcome. This is uh, Shoulder to Shoulders Public Conversation uh, featuring Deepa Iyer. Um, just to um, give a quick introduction, shoulder to shoulder, we are a multi-faith coalition of, of faith leaders and community leaders who are committed to countering anti-Muslim discrimination and building a society where all people are treated with respect and dignity, no matter their background um, or their faith. And, and so um, today uh, we are featuring uh, Deepa Iyer um, in, a, in a conversation around what our role is in creating social change. Um, we are at such an intense uh, time uh, in, our, in our society and, 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 and coming off of a, a really uh, jam-packed year, uh, 2020, and even the beginning of 2021, uh, so many events unfolded. Um, and and I, just uh, to uh, introduce myself, I'm the program director here at Shoulder to Shoulder. A few uh, fun facts about me. I, I worked as a faith-rooted organizer um, on economic justice issues um, in Los Angeles for, for years before coming to Shoulder to Shoulder. Um, I'm South Asian, uh, particularly I come from a Sri Lankan Catholic family, and I'm married to a United Church of Christ minister, and we have a five-month-old biracial baby boy, um, and and um, that is the, the, the light in our lives. Um, and I'm here again with, with Deepa Iyer, and you'll learn a little bit more about Deepa in this conversation. Um, she's a South Asian American writer, strategist, lawyer, and racial justice advocate. Uh, currently, Deepa is the director of movement building at Building Movement Project and works on a Solidarity Is project that provides trainings, narratives, and resources on building deep and lasting multiracial solidarity. Um, and so, and also I, I do want to mention Deepa wrote a book called We To Sing America, South Asian Arab Muslim and Sikh Immigrants Shaping Our Multiracial Future, which I read um, years back and, and really, really appreciated. So uh, welcome Deepa uh, to this conversation. Um, so I so want to open it up um, and start the conversation by asking, how did you come about creating this social change ecosystem? Well, thank you so much, Nina, for having me. Really appreciate um, your leadership, Catherine's leadership. It's so shoulder to shoulder, which has been such an important organization. And you spoke about the book I wrote about post 9-11 America, and um, you all have been really part of that story. So thank you for all that you do. And congratulations on being a new mom, um, from mom to mom, although my child is much older. <laughs> um, so so I'm so excited to be here and talk to you all about the social change ecosystem framework, um, which we'll also show in a little bit so folks have sort of a visual representation of what it looks like. But basically, Nina, the reason that I created it is um, to answer some questions, questions like, um, what do we do in times of crisis? Um, how do we take action to put our values into practice? And I think these are questions that a lot of people, whether we're involved in social change or we're adjacent to it, ask ourselves a lot. Like we know the vision that we have, we know that we want to participate and engage, but we oftentimes don't have a pathway to do it. Um, and I came, um, you know, developed this framework when I too, even though I've been doing social change work for a while, felt very confused and overwhelmed, um, particularly by everything that was happening over the past four years. And so it was a way for me to orient myself to um, my ecosystems. It was a way for me to get clear about my roles and strengths and then to take some steps. And so it's, this, it's in that spirit um, that I um, created it, developed it, um, honed it and have offered it to folks to use. That's great, that's great. Uh, so one of the first steps um, in, in your um, uh, social change ecosystem map, and, and there's actually, um, you can download, um, it's, it's like a, I'm forgetting the word now, it's, it's a it's guide. There we go, a guide. It's a guide um, to help you think through this. And one of the first steps is, is locating uh, your values at the center of the map. And, and I, I realized, you know, we, we think about our values and we talk about our values all the time, especially in the advocacy sphere, the organizing sphere, but we don't, I think it's a really profound exercise to think about, you know, um, 
using that as the center, the North Star, if we really are about equity, if we really are about accountability or uh, diversity or, or, or loyalty, you know, all of these different values, um, how are the roles that we take on and the actions that we take centering that. Um, and and I, I just, I thought that was really profound. Um, and, and one of the first questions that came to mind is, is sometimes we're operating in spheres, um, we're, we're situated in communities where people seem to have really different definitions of social change or, or social change values. So how can we unite around a shared set uh, of values? Yeah. So, so one of the fundamental, you know, there are three components to this framework and one of the fundamental uh, components is to actually get clear with our social change values. And, um, you know, a lot of folks who are native elders talk about the importance of being in right relationship. Um, so how are your actions in right relationship with your values? And so once we identify what they are, then we can ask ourselves, okay, how do my roles actually represent these values? Are they aligned with these values? Um, but the question you asked that, you know, sometimes we are not necessarily um, sharing the same values is a really important one. And one of the things that I'm hoping that this framework will do is enable people to have those conversations. Because oftentimes we can be involved in a campaign or we can be involved in a cause and we wonder why didn't that kind of um, why didn't that get us to where we thought we were going? And oftentimes it's because we didn't clarify a shared understanding of what our values are. We oftentimes set goals, but we don't talk about values as much. And so this is a way for us to get a little bit clearer on that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is um, sometimes people don't have the sh same shared values, and that's okay. People are on different you know parts of a continuum and trying to figure out what their values are. But one way to get clearer is also to take these lofty concepts and make them more real. You know, so when we're talking about, say, equity and inclusion, going the extra step of saying, and the resource guide has some prompts to enable people to do this, to say, well, what does that mean in my um, school, right? Does that mean that, you know, as a student or a parent, inclusion means in the ecosystem of the school that I'm trying to ensure that there's inclusive curricula in the classroom? Um, what does it mean from an equitable standpoint if I am in the workplace? Does that mean that we're committed to recruiting and mentoring people of color to be in that workplace? So going a step further by you know, identifying the values and then asking what do they mean for us can help us figure out if we actually have a shared understanding of those values. Mm, definitely. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, and can you, can you just share with us the, the framework and its components and the, the characteristics that you've, you've mapped out? Sure. Um, so I think that we're going to show the uh, framework on the screen. So hopefully folks can see this. Um, so the framework has three components to it. One is values, which we just talked about. And those are the um, places in the middle, the center of this um, framework where you can put in the values that are important to you. Um, the second part of this framework is really around roles. So what are the roles that I tend to show up as when I am in service to social change? There are 10 roles that are in this particular framework. You might find that there are other roles that you play and you're more than welcome to add obviously to the framework and the circles. The one thing to keep in mind um, is that roles are not our job titles. So this is also a way to sort of democratize the way in which we end up doing social change work when we're in organizational spaces that have a lot of hierarchy. And um, this helps us identify that some people can be, um, you know, a, a visionary, even if they're not necessarily in that particular job title, right? Um, so that's one way of thinking about that. And we'll talk about these roles, I think, a little bit more deeply in a bit. The third mm -hmm. aspect to this framework is that it is an ecosystem. And so even the way that the, the, the circles are kind of coming together within the roles indicate that feeling of an ecosystem. And what that means is that, you know, I think we all know that social change work can't happen in isolation, right? It requires a group of us, a coalition, a network, an organization, a community. And so thinking about who else is in the ecosystem, how do we share our roles? 
um, what happens if we're together in our ecosystem moving towards these values and actually aligning our roles appropriately. So those are the three components and the quotes that are on the slide as well, um, you know, just to quickly, I think that might help um, elucidate it more. Um, Nikki Giovanni um, has said, if you don't understand yourself, you don't understand anyone else. And I really like this quote because part of what an outcome is of this using this framework is greater self-awareness. It's the ability to sit and reflect a little bit, right? And that again is something that is hard to do because we work in high pressure environments. We work in cycles of crises. And so the ability to just actually take the time to reflect and do it on a quarterly basis, right? To learn a little bit more about how did I show up in that particular campaign or in that you know, particular moment? And how do I shift perhaps asking those questions? And then um, Grace Lee Boggs, um, uh, an Asian American scholar, writer, activist from Detroit, has said in this exquisitely connected world, it's never a question of critical mass, but critical connection. So that really, again, emphasizes the importance of relationship building within our ecosystems, that it's not how many people show up, it's about how deep our relationships are with each other in order to, again, align with the values that we care about and move towards a shared understanding of them. Yeah, and I, I, I did this exercise myself and I, I learned so much, not, not just about myself, but about shoulder to shoulder, about our partners. And, and, and it's like, you know, you can just kind of go deep into different spaces. And for me, I was thinking about not just myself in my role at shoulder to shoulder, which is a privilege. It's a, it's a privilege to be working in this role and to be a part of an ecosystem that's already been in place, um, you know, for years before I took on this position, but, but also in, in my, my own spheres, my, my family, my friends, my, um, my networks beyond my neighborhood, uh, you know, um, there's, there's so many different spheres um that 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 I find myself in um, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it is a multi-dimensional resource and tool in the sense that you can overlay different ecosystems on top of different ecosystems right so the roles that we might show up as in service to social change in our neighborhood or our college campus or our faith group might be different from the role that we play on a campaign, right? Um, and that's that's fine. It's more about knowing that and understanding how we're showing up because it also helps us to figure out what our power is, what our privilege is, and how to make tweaks as well in, in that way. Um, but it but absolutely it is about um, layering and trying to understand the holistic view of how each of us shows up and also how our ecosystems may or not may not be connecting to each other as well, right? Like you can tell us, you know, is you can do do it within an organization or a workplace or faith group. You can do it as um, you know part of a network or a coalition to identify partnerships. All of that is what I hope folks will use. But I'm really curious to know, Nina, what you identified as your primary roles. Sure. I mean, so this is kind of what it looked like to 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 write on it and, oh, and a make... little bit more, a little bit longer. Can you show it? Oh, I'm, it's it feels like it's so exposing and intimate <laughs> that you know um, that you're just thinking yeah, about. You're... I love it that you just took pen to paper and did it. Yeah, I I, I prefer I prefer yeah. pen to paper. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 you know, expanded upon these these values here at the center, and and really thinking about ab about that was it, it. It really was profound and and quite deep to think about um, what what do I care about? What do what do I want to um, uh, see highlighted in our work every single day? What do I want others to see? Um, and and what are we exuding? What is, what is at the center of what we do? And and I saw shoulder to shoulder. Um, as an organization, we've taken on different roles um, depending on on the scenario, the crisis, the um, event, the even our programming. You know, I can see us falling in in taking on some of these roles, and I even had some some others. For example, sustainer or or someone who is is giving their their resources um, um, to to um, 
a project um, or what have you, uh, a mediator, you know, someone who is able to kind of be in between and 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 hear and and create space for for those to 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 share. Um, and then something that I find myself um, taking on a lot is is like a worker bee, or I used to think of like the wheels. So like there's there's folks that are driving, but then there's there's folks that are like making things happen. Um, um, or um, as a joke, you know, with our team, I'd always say the wind beneath the wings. Like I want to be the wind. <laughs> um, and and so um, that those those were some of the the roles. Um, that I saw, uh, not just our organization, but but even me taking on, and part of part of me even facilitating this conversation is stretching um, beyond. You know, Catherine, our executive director, um, 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 has been has been leading these public conversations, and we were trying to experiment and try try new roles. And 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 for me, I tend to be more comfortable, you know, taking taking the um, the the wheels <laughs> um, um, role. Um, but but that was stretching and and so really appreciated that that task, I guess. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of these different roles um, mm -hmm. because they might give people an understanding of how they show up. And I'd love to hear more about um, what are some of the, the observations you had, Nina? Um, and I love what you said about stretching because that's one of the, the outcomes of this, right? In terms of recognizing that, oh, I tend to show up as you know a guide a lot and I wanna try to stretch to figure out what it means to be a disruptor. Mm -hmm. And so how do we actually um, take chances run experiments and you're doing an awesome job by the way <laughs> stretching into this role um so it's obviously something you can do very well um but maybe we can go through a couple of them um so you know you talked about the worker bee and that's really what a builder usually does right so builders and folks can also download the descriptions of the roles if they like on the link that cassandra sent over um but builders are people who actually are able to um, take a vision, take see the North Star that a visionary might put forth and really build the scaffolding, um, you know, build the foundations. So when I often see my child playing with Legos, I think about being a builder, right? So builders are the ones who can put the spreadsheets together. They have the run of show. They've organized um, how an event is going to happen, right? Um, so they're really the ones, and oftentimes, just as you said, Nina, they're not necessarily visible or front-facing, right? Um, because they're really putting the programming together. Um, they work really well with visionaries. So you can even think of some complementary roles. So builders work well with visionaries because visionaries are the people who see the North Star. They're able to remind us where we're headed and they're able to do it oftentimes in a way that inspires us almost, right? Um, so there are many visionaries that we think about, I think even when we look at our own movements, you know, Dr. King, for example, was certainly a visionary, right? Um, he was many other roles as well, I would say in this ecosystem framework, but certainly he's someone who inspired a particular vision around economic justice, social justice, anti-war that we still hold to this day. Um, so that's an example of two that oftentimes go together. Mm -hmm. um, and then tell me a couple of the others that you chose that are on the map. Sure, weavers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and seeing, you know, seeing through, as you described, seeing through the lines of connectivity between people, places, organizations, ideas, and movements. Um, I've seen, you know, at Shoulder to Shoulder, we put together, you know, unlikely partners um, uh, or um, uh, bringing together folks that might not have have gathered in the first place. Um, you know, I can see I can see times that we've taken on um, uh, as frontline responders, you know, yeah. um, being a part partner um, in crisis uh, to, to, to figure out a strategy or a plan, um, putting together talking points and sharing that with folks. Um, you know, encouraging folks to, to write op-eds and, and making sure they have the resource to do so. Um, experimenters, you know, just in the last couple of years, we've experimented with new programs. For example, we did a Ramadan road trip where we visited um, iftars um, in, in different cities around the country uh, to tell stories of the and show the diversity of the American Muslim community. Um, and, and that was a total experiment that, um, you know, we came out some, some really beautiful videos that came out from that. Um, 
um, this year we had to, to pivot um, our Ramadan work um, and, and created a, a virtual um, a welcome to my table initiative where we partnered, we, we put households together to be in relationship and connect with each other. So uh, again, that was, that was um, experimenting with a new idea that could have gone um, uh, badly, especially with um, um, partnering households, you know, it's, it's a very intimate um, um, thing to do, but, but it, it, you know, we learned a lot and, and we um, were able to yeah. tell some really amazing stories from that. Um, are, do you, in your, in, in, in what you've seen, do you think that there are ever times that we might fall short um, of the roles we take on? Um, we're not doing our roles well. Um, what are some examples of what we can do? And, and also should we be sharing roles? And what does is, what is sharing look like? And, and what happens you know, when we're doing like a more macro mapping of the ecosystem where there might be um, um, other organizations or communities um, um, either competing or even clashing in their roles? You know, what, what does that look like? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question. I loved your your examples of how um, shoulder to shoulder has played an experimental role. I think that a lot of um, organizations and people are doing that, particularly with the pandemic, right? Because you know we are not able to organize uh, household to whole household or even face to face like we often do when we build social change causes. And so, what does it mean to experiment virtually? What does it mean to do outreach to hard hardest hit communities who are dealing with the pandemic about the vaccine? We're going to have to experiment. And experimentation is exactly what you said. You know, this uh, this um, this aspiration to take a risk, but also this recognition that there will be bumps along the way. And the goal of experimentation is to learn about those and to course correct um, for the next time mm -hmm. around, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, in in terms of your question around, um, you know, do the do the roles oftentimes, um, you know, I think you asked. Um, do they actually, is it good for us to share roles? What happens if roles clash? Um, so absolutely we should be sharing roles, um, especially if we're part of an ecosystem, right? It isn't to say that one, only one person in our organization is a dis disruptor and only one person is a storyteller. It's really important actually to recognize how we're sharing roles and to work even better together. So when I have done this exercise with organizations, um, oftentimes folks recognize that, oh, I didn't know that so-and-so that I work closely with thinks of themselves as a storyteller, right? And so what does that mean then? How do I, um, how, how can that person's voice perhaps come out more in the organization? Maybe they would write a blog post more often. Maybe they will um, engage on social media on behalf of the organization more often, right? So there are ways to mm -hmm. identify and share some of these roles in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that um, in many ways, this ecosystem is made for collaboration. You know, that's really the key of it. And mm -hmm. so um, if you find that you're clashing with roles, it, that's honestly a question of having some courageous conversations, right? About mm -hmm. where people see themselves, um, how they are leaning into those roles, where there might be some conflict um, in terms of playing those roles. And that happens a lot, even when you think of a coalition or a network, like organizations can clash with each other because mm -hmm. they, you know, one organization might want to be the visionary and seen as a visionary, or, and others might want to also hold on to vision, right? So how do you build shared vision? How do you share the role of communicating vision? So those are all questions that actually can come out of having this initial threshold conversation. So mm -hmm. as you're beginning a campaign, as you're beginning a new project, you, you know, this might be a handy way of understanding where folks play in terms of what their roles are and how they also learn to do the, do the work collaboratively. Mm. And, and, you know, a part of the exercise is really thinking you you ask a question about power and privilege and thinking about um where we fall and and it depends right on the the ecosystem that that we're we're thinking about um the the first part of that question is when we're not taking up enough space how can we overcome you know our feelings of doubt um or the imposter complex or perhaps like you know the the systems of oppression that that make us feel like we shouldn't take space how do we how do we step into our roles with confidence yeah 
um, I'd love to know how you did that, Nina, because it sounded like you stretched a bit to um, <laughs> to do this as well. Um, yeah, I think it's very common that we all, you know, I, I definitely do as well, have imposter complexes that we deal with, right, that um, push us to thinking, well, I'm not good enough, or should I be the person, or I'm not ready yet. And those are really important questions to think about. I think it's also important to understand and distinguish between what you said, um, you know, is it something that we truly feel we're not ready for? Um, how do we distinguish that from sort of culture, white dominant culture that oftentimes, especially with people of color, women makes us feel that we're not ready to step into certain roles. So I think distinguishing some of that is very important and understanding the differences. And then I would say, um, you know, the way that I have often done it in terms of taking on different roles is to actually look for guides. So a guide is actually part of you know, is one of the roles in the framework. And to find guides who are doing similar things and to actually request and ask for their mentorship, you know, and ask like, how, what would you suggest? You know, I wanna be say a storyteller and I've always been a frontline responder. Like I'm a crisis responder and mm -hmm. I really want to um, move into being more of a storyteller. And so talking to a guide who perhaps already uses that role or plays that role can help us understand how we can do it. Um, another thing is to ask for permission, you know, to ask um, those who might be playing those roles already, would it be okay if I also stepped into that role? Um, how would you um, prefer me to step into that role, right? Mm -hmm. So um, asking for permission, understanding that, you know, we can't get to like the zenith of what we want, but we take small steps to develop our skills and our strengths. And then um, really being um, mindful of the others who are playing those roles and asking for their guidance and support are all ways in which we can stretch beyond the mm -hmm. imposter complexes that we feel. Mm. It's so helpful. So it's so helpful. And and what about, you know, like the, the alternative of that, like perhaps we might be taking up too much space and, and we recognize that. And, uh, you know, how do we make space for those who have been marginalized? How do we step back and where, where should that energy be redirected? Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, just to highlight again, is that this framework really, um, I think, interrogates the dominant cultural norms that we have in a lot of our organizations or our campaigns around um, who gets to do what, hierarchy, decision making, and the like. It doesn't say that we should get rid of all of that. You know, I do actually believe that it is important at, in, in, in many ways to oftentimes have people who are going to able to make decisions, equipped to make decisions and the like, right? Um, but it interrogates it. And what it does is it asks us um, to understand this, not as a hierarchy of roles, but as everyone actually being equally committed to the values. And so when you come from that framework, it's more about how do we all play a role in service to these values? How do we all play a role that advances these values instead of, well, I say we should do this and then you have to do that, right? Um, so mm -hmm. it actually interrogates that, um, those kinds of standards of decision-making and consensus and hierarchy and power. And so in terms of power and privilege, one of the prompts that I encourage folks to do, and I try to reflect on myself quite a bit, is have I been playing a role constantly? Mm -hmm. Right. And if I have been playing a role constantly, then is there a way for me to mentor or guide someone else into that role? Um, do I have the capacity mm -hmm. to sustain my role? You know, that's another big question. Like, how long have I been doing this? Right. How mm -hmm. is it? What what is um, the toll on me? What is the impact on me? Um, so, for example, you know, I tend to be someone who is a frontline responder and have done that quite a bit, especially since 9-11. And at some point, I think um, 10 to 15, 10 years down, uh, you know, after 9-11, I started to realize that my capacity was quite limited. I was feeling a lot of um, burnout. I was feeling numb often. I couldn't respond to things in, I think, the way that I should have because I was walling off a lot of my emotions. 
And I started to recognize that being a frontline responder wasn't good for me and it wasn't good for the ecosystem that I was part of, right? And so um, I made a decision shortly thereafter to step out of my role, the, the job I held, uh, the position I had, and to find another role. You know, and for me, it was a storyteller role to tell the stories of the communities that I had been um, involved with over uh, since since 9-11, for example. And so asking ourselves um, how we actually think about our capacity, but then also thinking about power, right? Are we, um, are we constantly in the same role over and over, which means that others don't get to get to come into those spaces, right? Um, how do we use our privilege of playing that role and actually guide more people in? That doesn't mean that we have to step out entirely. It just mm -hmm. means that we open up space for others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is there, is there, I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions that, yeah. that folks are asking, you know, one is, is how do we work within our tendencies and how supremacy pushes to create a hierarchy of these roles? So some roles are seen as more important in spheres. Like how do we, how do we dismantle that notion? And, and I love the map for that reason, um, just being existing. Um, but, but then a, a, another question is, is what are some successful strategies to use when conflict occurs and when others don't want your involvement in specific ways? Yeah. So certainly, um, you know, just as an example, when the uprisings were happening last summer in the wake mm -hmm. of anti-Black violence, um, the role of disruptors and frontline responders was very visible, right? These were the folks who were on the streets, they were organizing rallies, they were organizing the protests in cities across the country that we needed. And I think a lot of folks at that time were using this framework and would ask me, um, you know, I can't be visible like that because I um, I can't go out because of the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it, I feel like whatever role I play, it's just not going to be good enough, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to be enough. And so again, um, this was I an opportunity. That, by the way, <laughs> yeah, no, so did I. Um, but this was a way to say, well, not all of us can be on the streets all the time, being a frontline responder, right? But what what can we do? So some people then became caregivers to frontline responders, right? Some people actually became storytellers sharing the stories of frontline responders. Still others decide to go into their own workplaces or organizations to be builders. How do we actually reflect what is happening outside that commitment to ending anti-Black violence inside our organization, right? Mm -hmm. So that is one way of thinking about um, when some roles do get visible, how we can still feel connected to our values and the shared values of society without feeling like we have to play that one role. Mm. And in terms of the conflict question, and it's great to hear the questions, please keep sending them in. Um, in terms of conflict, so there, are, well, there will be times when people you know, in the ecosystem framework might say, you know what, that's great that you wanna be a, um, a visionary, but we don't really have room for that in our organization, right? And so this is where, again, um, it's important to think about ecosystems as being multiple ones. We cannot all, like, you know, those of us who are working at nonprofits or social change organizations, um, that's one arena where we put our heart in to advancing social change. But just as you said, Nina, there are other arenas too our family, our friends, our neighborhoods, our alumni network, a professional association, right? There are a lot of other ways, a lot of other ecosystems. So I would often say, um, how does that energy, how can that energy show up, right, in another way? Um, another example, you know, based on my own experience, I don't show up often as a caregiver in my work environment, but I like being a caregiver, right? So I think about being a caregiver to my kid, or I think about, um, uh, I'm a coach, right? And so in that way, after I was able to get my certification, I was able to give care to young women of color in nonprofits and, and build in my caregiver role that way. So it's just an example of using different ecosystems, perhaps. Conflict is unavoidable, so I'm not going to say that it doesn't happen. But I think that hopefully thinking about multiple ecosystems is a way of dealing with that challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's so clear that this ecosystem can be helpful 
in so many different spheres and arenas. And, you know, someone, someone is mentioning that this is really helpful when we think about writing a job description for a new colleague, you know, what are the roles that are missing and what do we need? How can we complement one another in, in that new, new role? Um, uh, another, another point made is, is movement coalitions, you know, thinking about division of labor and, and saying, and using this system as a way to, uh, 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 bring about the changes we want. Um, and the question is, is how can this be used for strengthening coalitions of diverse organizations coming together? Thanks, Ron, for that question. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I would say that, you know, networks and coalitions can use this as an exercise to start and as well as a middle reflection and then an evaluation at the end. And what it does is, again, it enables organizations to not just think about, okay, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to put the social media packet together and I'm going to, you know, reach out to the members of Congress, right? It, it, instead of just being in that sense, which we need, I'm not saying we don't need to figure that out. Hmm. It allows us to take a step back and understand what is the role that we're bringing into a coalition. So for example, just as you had pointed out, um, sometimes what we're able to do is bring in uh, the role of being a weaver in a coalition and, and, if you recognize that you can be a weaver, then that means that you're able to bring different communities to that particular coalition. You're able to use the language that's needed to get the message and the goal of this coalition across lots of different diverse communities, right? And so that role and understanding that can then make you as an organization um, empowered to actually reach out to different communities and different constituencies. Um, or if you see your role as a disruptor in the coalition, that's not necessarily within the coalition space, but outside the coalition space, right? Your organization might be the one that is ready to organize your members um, for direct action, right? Mm -hmm. um, for potentially um, uh, some sort of um, civil disobedience even, right? So um, organizing ourselves into these roles at the beginning Again, leaning into the strengths that we bring as organizations into these coalitions and networks can help us get more clear about the roles we can play beyond the tasks that we get and the responsibilities that we often get. Mm. Mm. And, and to even ask another uh, uh, application of, of the ecosystem, you know, there's a lot of folks that are joining our trainings um, who are connected to this work and, and doing this work in their communities. Um, and they live and work in red and rural regions where um, perhaps there might be little to no uh, Muslims, uh, South Asians um, uh, living in their area. Um, what are some of the examples of the roles and actions they can take um, in those communities, and, and particularly now, you know, as we're in such a divided and polarized society, and and um, you know, we tend to feel safer, and we tend to, to to congregate with folks that that look and think like us. You know, how do we how do we use or think about some of the roles? What what would a weaver do? What would a disruptor do? Um, what are some of the the ideas that you can give us? That is such a great question, Nina. And I'd love to hear from folks who are listening and you and others as well. I mean, I can take a stab at it. Um, so I think that, you know, the value that I heard you talk about there is um, a value of connectivity, a value of solidarity, um, a value of community, um, a value of understanding, right? Um, and so I think getting clear on what those values are, are very important. And then thinking about, well, how do those values come into the reality? If I am in a red, red quote, red state, or if I'm in a rural area where there perhaps isn't as much diversity, right? How do I lean into those values? So I would say, for example, um, you know, there are folks um, who see themselves as being, um, you know, healers who I think are so important to just generally our, our society in this moment, but also in this particular ecosystem framework, um, who can really tend to some of the, the trauma, the collective trauma that people face across generations, right? And so um, these are often people who understand ancestral trauma. There are people who have the ability to dip into indigenous forms of healing um, that can, can help us understand what restorative justice means what restorative practices are. So one example is actually to um, 
see if there are healers in your community that can actually give voice to what the wound is. Because I really do feel like unless you can name the wound, unless you can name the pain, right? It's really hard to find the bomb and the solve and the, to, 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 to tend to it. Otherwise we just put a bandaid on it. And so we need to move to the bomb and not the bandaid to alliterate a little bit there. <laughs> but, um, so, so healer, so being a healer in terms of naming that ancestral trauma is important. And I'm particularly talking here about people of color who might be living in those areas, right? Mm -hmm. um, in some communities. Um, but if you're somebody who's not a person of color and you are say someone who's white and wants to be involved in um, connectivity and some of the other values that I mentioned, then um, you might wanna think of yourself as a disruptor. And being a disruptor oftentimes means having shaking up the status quo. It means having some conversations that are often difficult to have for people, right? That people wanna run away from. And so um, there are many people who play this role if they're having those courageous conversations with their family members about racism, if they are hearing negative stereotypes about communities of color to actually um, put a pause on that, to say that's uncomfortable and this is why and right. Um, actually disrupting for the sake of the value, not just for the sake of the disruption. Um, so disruptors are people that I often think of as Congressman Lewis used to call getting into good trouble, right? So thinking mm -hmm. of that, so how can you, if you are a white person who's committed to um, these values that we've talked about around solidarity, actually use your power and privilege to be a disruptor in order to force some of these conversations out in the open and to happen. So those are just two examples, one for people of color and then one for white folks. Yeah, no, I was, you know, in reflecting on on the roles, one of the examples of a disruptor um, that I think of with with um, in, in sh with shoulder to shoulder um, was at our trainings, um, um, there was Dr. Todd Green. He's a white Christian male um, um, and, and he would, enter the space by saying, I'm going to uh, challenge us. And he would disrupt by saying, I'm going to challenge us by, by um, what if Islamophobia is not about lack of knowledge of Islam, but it's about racism. Mm -hmm. And and that was one of the first things that he would say. And it would be like a, a like a punch in the gut to some folks that, you know, who, who don't want to identify as, as racist, but um, uh, reframing how how we think and disrupting the space, and I loved the way he used his his privilege and his identity to to say that you know just very specifically. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and that's and 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 I think that you know many of these roles can come into um, into people's experiences right now. Um, I think that people can hopefully actually also be builders and experimenters in places in rural communities, right? Like what does it actually mean to build um, an anti-racism initiative or organization that is led by white folks in order to talk to mm -hmm. white communities, right? I think mm -hmm. a lot of times we find that people of color not only have to bear the weight of dealing with the trauma of racism in this country, but then having to explain it Mm -hmm. having to um, disrupt people's thought patterns, having to find and provide new approaches for them, um, having to suggest books for them to read, right? And um, I think that a lot of white folks in this moment, um, those who are tied to faith communities and not, can really play a role as building uh, builders to actually build out what a white-led um, organization or a white-led initiative could look like if, um, if they started to focus in on those values. Mm. Mm. And what about what about when we get exhausted um, in these roles? You know, burnout. Uh, we're we're working so hard and we're doing so much. What what happens then? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, one of the key you know reflection prompts in the guide that was shared earlier is what is the toll um, of playing this role. What is the toll on you psychically and um, emotionally? What is the toll on you physically? And how do you even put words to that, right? Um, I think a lot of us, when we care about these values and the issues around us, tend to really kind of work ourselves to the bone, you know, tend mm -hmm. to go past our capacity. And that is why there is so much vicarious and direct trauma 
in our organizations and communities and movements. That is why there is so much turnover. Um, that is why people leave and don't ever return to work mm. environments. Mm -hmm. There is also a cycle of crisis that we are often attending to, right? It's crisis after crisis. Just in 2020, we had the overlapping crises of the pandemic, the political climate, and the uprisings against anti-Black violence. Um, those are three significant crises that we were actually dealing with. Many organizations were dealing with, many movement leaders were dealing with. And um, so working in a cycle of crisis and oftentimes doing it with very limited resources, you know, very limited resources, right? Yep. Staff, funding, whatever. Um, so this, so it's no surprise then when you add, you know, the direct and vicarious trauma of doing this work, plus being under resourced, plus attending to cycles of crises. It's no wonder, right, that we feel um, exhausted, that we feel at capacity. And then oftentimes I would say another crisis that often comes into play is just within our organizations and movements. You know, we tend to sometimes, I think, um, be in environments where we feel the, the white dominant cultural standards of having to perform all the time, having yeah. to produce all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then there are the movement dynamics, organization to organization or person to person, right? Distrust, um, call outs, right? Like you're not woke enough, so you can't be in this particular coalition. Um, so, uh, so there is a lot of that happening. And so, so it is no wonder, right? That oftentimes we feel at capacity and drain. And so part of understanding our roles is actually asking that question. Am I showing up in a particular role all the time? And what is the toll that it is taking on me? Mm -hmm. What are the practices that I want to build from a sustainability standpoint? And I'm not just talking about self-care, you know, mm -hmm. like not everyone can engage in self-care, right? It is mm -hmm. honestly sometimes a privileged thing to be able to say that. Absolutely. It's also something that has to be a commitment from the organizations we work in from the sector we're in, it has to be a commitment from philanthropy that is funding our sector too, that it's about um, practices and policies that we put into place to sustain this work for the long run. And I think we're seeing some of that happen actually naturally because of the, the pandemic, um, but we need to be able to really sustain these policies and practices in the long run. So, um, so, so self-awareness, getting clear about what the toll and the impact is, what triggers us, what is pushing us too hard, and then what are the both the individual practices and the organizational practices that we can actually put into place um, to sustain us, and then also having the ability to take breaks, to be like, I'm going to check out of the ecosystem for a bit. I can't, you know, and I'll find my way back in some other capacity or role. Mm, that's so helpful. And sorry, my household is, is quite noisy. That's the benefit of a multi-generational house. There's, there's lots of activity. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't um, apologize. <laughs> um, is do you think that there's ever a time that we might be expected to take on, uh, you know, certain roles or or so many roles because we might be in the minority? Perhaps we are the 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 few folks that that gather and work on these issues and are conscious of these issues in our in our communities. Perhaps we might be the minority um, in, in the space, and so everyone's expecting um, um, us to be engaged because we there's only a few of us. Um, you know what happens then? Like how do you how do you um, communicate that need? How do you bring more people in? Um, you know, how, how, with those expectations. And I, I think it kind of goes in line with, with an earlier um, point that we were talking about in terms of hierarchy of roles and, and what have you. Yeah, well, I think um, it is absolutely true that sometimes both people and organizations are expected to play the same roles time and again. I think that, you know, um, it's, it's often the case that people of color, particularly women of color, are expected to play the caregiver role. Um, in our movements and our work and the like, right? Like the person that brings, um, that, that, that makes sure that people are actually talking about their hearts and how they're feeling and things like that, right? It's usually women of color who hold that space. Um, I think that it's really important when we're, when we're recognizing that, that these ex expectations exist to actually ask for the rest of the ecosystem to step up, right? Um, so it is an opportunity to say, well, it, it seems like 
you know, our organization is always playing or expected to play the role of the disruptor because we're a frontline organization. We directly organize immigrants or refugees, and we are always expected to bring their stories to this coalition, but we are never in the role of, say, a visionary, or um, we're never in the role of um, uh, a builder, right? And so it's also an opportunity to actually hold the ecosystem accountable. So I think when we figure that out, when we're figuring out that there's a certain group of people, whether they're because they are, um, as you said, uh, by virtue of their identity or by virtue of how proximate they are to communities expected to keep on playing the same roles time and again, it's an opportunity to hold the entire system accountable, the, the entire ecosystem accountable and to say, we need to shift. We need to figure out a way that we can um, co-share a little bit more. Mm, that's so helpful. There's so much more that I want to dive in with you about. And there, you know, there for folks to know, um, we are um, really grateful to be able to work with Deepa on um, uh, uh, hosting an in-depth workshop on this very conversation um, on the social change ecosystem. Um, and that's coming up um, uh, next month. So um, that's something to, to, to look into if you want to go deeper um, into this space. Um, Deepa, what do you think folks should know um, as or revisit, I guess, um, constantly in this work um, as we're coming to a close in this conversation um, and, and we're thinking about this ecosystem, what's something that you think we should come back to? Um, I love hearing your, your baby's cries there. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's like, I think the hour is up, mommy. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I would, I would say that if you are feeling, um, confused or overwhelmed, if you are feeling um, sort of like you're playing whack-a-mole, you know, constantly, if you're feeling at capacity, take a look at this framework and utilize it to do some self-reflection. Utilize it as part of a staff meeting um, or a board retreat. Um, you know, utilize it as an exercise when you're um, organizing a coalition or a network and come back to it, you know, every quarter. Um, come back to it if there's a crisis moment and you're unclear about what your role should be. Um, so taking some time to do that, um, I think can be useful. And as you said, I'm, I'm you know, here to assist in that process for folks who wanna take deeper dives and look at their organizations, map their organizations out, um, think about what each of these roles actually means in terms of characteristics, room for growth, um, I'll be doing a series on Instagram Live this year where we explore each role in depth each month and talk about some of the characteristics as well as the areas for growth and also examples, both historical and contemporary, of people who play these roles. And so um, look out for some of that. Right. But again, this is an open source tool in the sense that you can use it in its intact form in your own um, in your own reflection work with your organizations and the like, feel free to please utilize it. Um, I want there to be, you know, I, I hope it spurs some of that self-reflection, but then also action, which is what we desperately need to advance social change. Mm. And and for folks that, that are registered, um, you will get information of how to follow Deepa and how to find um, Deepa's work. Um, but if you wouldn't mind just sharing for, for folks that are watching, um, how can folks find you? Yes, so you can find me um, on Twitter where I usually end up being a disruptor. You can find me on Instagram where I'm more of a storyteller and you can also email me and I'll put all of that into the chat um, if you're interested in um, workshops or sessions, things of that nature. I love that. I love how you're thinking about roles with social media. <laughs> um, and that's another set of questions that I have for a later time. <laughs> so well, you know, you're a born weaver. So I don't know if you picked that for yourself, mm -hmm. but I think you're, you, you demonstrated that time and again in our conversation. So mm -hmm. and it's so great to be in conversation with another South Asian American woman. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I might take you up on the, the, asking of, of mentorship or, or guides in the future. Um, so, so folks, there's a, there's a couple of, of visuals we'll, we'll show you of upcoming events. 
Um, February 12th is the, the, the in-depth workshop with Deepa on um, the social change ecosystem. Um, and again, that, that will be a deeper dive into this and, and um, hopefully you'll leave with, with a lot of next steps um, um, as you are from this conversation. Um, our next public conversation is next month, um, Black History Month, and it's featuring Akolo Rashid, um, who is a founder of the um, uh, Museum, International Museum of Muslim Cultures, and Asila Rashid, who is a founder of an organization called the Muslim Mix that brings together young Muslims um, and uh, in the interfaith sphere in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the museum is in Mississippi and they just so happen to be mother and daughter. So it will be an, a multi-generational conversation um, that we look forward to, to hosting. Um, uh, another is we have a Faith Over Fear training coming up. In, in February, March, the, there will be three sessions um, that are live. And then in between there is um, work that you would do self-guided um, on your own. And um, this is a, a, a messaging and strategies training. There are three core components, understanding the problem, anti-Muslim discrimination and Islamophobia, and then messaging how to talk about it and in the spheres of influence that you are in, um, and then what to do about it, strategies and, and, and learning from leaders around the country who have done this well. So um, we welcome you to register. We welcome you to spread the word. And, and please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us um, at Shoulder to Shoulder if you're looking for something in specific um, um, or want to be connected to, to folks um, in this sphere. We are always here for you as a staff and really grateful for the time that, that um, you took to be with us today and, and more soon. Um, we are so grateful for Deepa um, and Deepa's insight and these this great tool um, that Deepa is sharing with us um, and um, more soon. Thanks again. Thank you.